Shelby from Oklahoma Christian University and a Master of Science in Medical Sciences from Mississippi College. Had been practicing medicine for 12 years, she now homeschools her children and has found this to be the time of greatest learning and challenge to date. In her free time, she enjoys horseback riding and has been thrilled to share this pastime with her children. Please welcome Ms. Alicia Parker. Children, because you have known the Father. 
I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Have you ever gotten some kind of group email and you're going through it and you're thinking, ooh, I'm not really sure I was even supposed to be included in this, right? Um, but John, he comes out and he's talking and he doesn't say who he is and he doesn't say who they are, but then he pauses to say, this is important for you because of who you are. And they know this is a message for them. And I hope that as you read that and you see, oh, people who are forgiven, people who know the Father, people who have overcome the evil one, does that pertain to me too? And then our third group is the deceivers. It's apparent from the writing that there has been opposition to John and the community of fellow Christ followers. And this has created his motive for writing to them and what he says. He introduces these opponents in chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. And he doesn't really give their names, but he gives some key characteristics about them. He says, most notably, that it's a group of people who deny that Jesus is the Messiah. And he calls them antichrists or deceivers. And in verse 26, he says, I'm writing to you about them because they're trying to lead you astray. Now, I think it's important to introduce you to a group of people who were known to live during the time of John in Asia Minor. John doesn't say what their names are, but there's writings by second century Christians like Irenaeus. He wrote a five volume book set about false teachers and about how they were wrong. And it was called Against Heresies. And then there have been some good archaeological even in 1945, a huge find of many documents that substantiate this information that Irenaeus gave us. And these people have been come to known as the Gnostics. And the Gnostics had kind of three things that they believed that I think are pertinent to what the verses that we're talking about today. Number one, they said that all matter in the physical world is evil. And the spiritual world is good. And you can't change that. There's nothing you can do about it. The matter of the physical world is pure evil, and the spirit is good, and there are two things that come from that. Number one, Jesus couldn't have been in the flesh. The flesh is part of this world. The flesh is evil. That couldn't have possibly have been Jesus. And then number two, we're stuck in the flesh, and because of that, our flesh and what we do must not have anything to do with what we believe. And it may not have anything to do with our salvation. So there must be some special knowledge, some way that our heart and our minds can attain salvation with disregard to these bad physical bodies that we're stuck in. And so they came up with this idea called dualism. And they said there is a complete disconnect between the mind and the body. The body is inherently evil, so we'll just go ahead and let it live that way. And then it's okay for the body to do or partake in anything in this physical world because the mind will just continue in its quest for this special knowledge and that's what's important for salvation. It doesn't matter how you live, it's all in what you know. Now, it's apparent that these opponents to John were these same people. In 2 John 7, he says, these deceivers are denying that Jesus came in the flesh. He's saying, it's these false teachers, and what they're teaching is wrong. John's defense can be a little bit confusing if you don't recognize from the beginning that it's a defense against these opponents. But as you start seeing those opponents and the false teachings that they were giving, there are so many aha moments where you'll start saying, oh, that's what John was talking about. The other thing that makes John a little bit confusing is that he's very repetitive when you look at it. And the reason he is repetitive is because he's using a style of writing that's called amplification. He's kind of upset, and he's starting with one topic, and that immediately leads him to another topic, and then he goes to another topic, and before long he's made a full circle, and he's back at the first one again. And I wish he didn't do that. I really like it if he would just come in and say, okay, the deceivers told you this, 
And here are the three reasons that that is wrong. And then the deceivers told you this, and here are two scriptures that you can use to refute that, but that's not what he's doing. He's going to talk in this circular nature, and he's going to start talking about major themes like love for God and our fellow man, and walking in the light, and how that creates fellowship with God, and then there's sin and forgiveness, and he presents this overall tapestry. He weaves them all together to say that there is a very distinct way that people live in relationship with God in Christ. And as he writes in these circles of amplification, he's going to use really strong contrasts. He says there's light and there's darkness, there's love and there's hate, and each of those show us that the way of Christ is in direct opposition to the way of the false teachers and the devil. He uses these two styles to make a very clear, strong argument against the deceivers. You can start to feel the tension. You can hear the false teaching that's been occurring through John's defense. And the deceivers are in stark opposition to what John is teaching. And the readers have started hearing both sides. And some of them have left Christianity. The people he's writing to are the people who have stayed. But they're hearing this teaching, and they might start asking questions like, um, Jesus not in the flesh. You mean like Mary didn't give birth to the Son of God? Is Jesus the Messiah then? Who is the Messiah? Was that really the Son of God who died on the cross? And if he was not in the flesh when he died, then he couldn't have been raised from the dead. And that means no resurrection. Without resurrection, there's not forgiveness. Jesus said that by knowing him is how we know the Father. John, you just said that we know the Father, but do we? How can we possibly overcome the evil one if we don't have Jesus? But John just said, I saw this Jesus. He was most definitely in the flesh. And you are the people who are forgiven, who know the Father, and who have overcome the evil one. I can just see John. He's ferociously typing away. Not really, you know, he has a quill, right? So he's writing. And there's not time for a formal introduction. He knows who he is, and they know who they are. And he knows exactly who needs to hear this teaching. And he lays into important, urgent information. The teachings about Jesus are so interconnected, it's impossible for him to talk about just one thing without moving on to the next and moving on to the next. I love that. Do you love that about the teachings of Jesus? They are so consistent, always. They don't contradict each other. We can stand on them. But consider the deceivers. What better way to destroy the church? I'll just stop that. Than to cause the people to doubt their Savior or how to live their lives in following the Savior. John's not going to stand for it. How distressing. He had lived and walked with Jesus, and he loved Jesus. And Jesus was his friend and had become his savior. John is living in a way that demonstrates that, and he's pleading with these readers to do the same thing. He's not about to stand by the side and let his, these Christians be deceived. So he comes barging through with a message. I'm going to try to highlight it as he goes through each circle. So... Uh, We're going to start in 1, 5, and 6. He says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and we walk in the darkness, we lie. We do not live out in the truth. Chapter 2, verse 1. I write these things to you so that you will not sin. 2, 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys this word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. 2.15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. 3.6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has seen him or known him. 3, 7 through 10. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. 
The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. You see, he's talking about light and darkness and sin and confession. He says, I'm writing so that you won't sin. But in 15, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, he lays into this, and it is a clear warning. Let's read that passage. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. The message is written as a clear warning not a subsequent command, as in, well, now that you've become a Christian, we're going to start on not loving the world. These are the people who have already made the decision to leave the world and begin a new life with the Father. And to go back and love the world again would put them in opposition to their current commitment to God. John is clear that loving the world is completely incompatible with loving God. Have you ever noticed there can be confusion in the English language, right? There are words that we use in different contexts and they mean completely different things. So let's clearly define world. It's not talking about the physical world, like that can be depicted with a globe or a map. John 1 says that Jesus created that world and that it is good. I'm thankful for our beautiful world that God created for us to live in. It also cannot be referring to just all of mankind. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. We're not talking about that. In 519, it says the world is under the control of the evil one. That's the world John is talking about. It's being used in a negative connotation to depict this rebellious lifestyle that stands in opposition to God. And this lifestyle seeks to gratify the flesh. It's encompassed by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Wearsby says it this way, a Christian is a member of the human world and they live in the physical world, but they don't belong to the spiritual world that is Satan's system of opposing God. Now, John gives three categories of the world. <coughs> Sorry. All that is in the world is described in these three categories. He says there's desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. This word desires comes from the Greek text epithumia, and it means a longing, especially for what is forbidden. That's a deep felt heart issue. Different translators have called it desire, lust, cravings. It's an action that comes from within an individual's heart when they fail to find complete joy in the love of the Father. They fail to find their love in God and they start to look elsewhere in the physical world to try to satisfy those desires. So John is making a clear refute to this Gnostic idea of dualism. It's not appropriate or even possible for us to allow our physical bodies to sin and it not affect our hearts. These things we do in the world are from cravings that come from our heart. The desires of the flesh are evident. If we fail to find joy in the Lord and the, Lord, and the world starts appealing to our normal appetites and tempts us to fulfill them in forbidden ways. So think about hunger becomes gluttony, rest becomes laziness. Or the opposite, we work so hard that we're striving for things. Sex starts turning to pornography, sexual immorality, adultery, selfish indulgences that destroy relationships and our usefulness in life. The desires of the eyes, when we fail to find joy in the Lord and we start turning to pleasures that will gratify our sight and our mind. It may be entertainment intellectual pursuits that are contrary to the will of God, 
the movies we watch, the concerts and events we go to, the music we listen to and the places we go to for entertainment, or maybe just how we spend our time. A time of rejuvenation might be needed, but we gotta get back to serving. We can't just gather money for recreation and leisure. We need to be finding ways to serve people around us. We can't find joy in accumulating extreme excess when there are people around us who need our excess. <clears throat> when we fail to find joy in the Lord, we start seeking out the pride of life. And you might even call it the pride in my life. We find our joy and fulfillment in the gathering of many possessions for ourselves and pursuing accomplishments in an effort to impress others. Maybe a false facade on social media or buying houses and cars that we can't afford. And these three are depicted in the first temptation of Eve, Genesis 3, 6 through 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, desire of the flesh, and it was a delight to the eyes, desire of the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, pride of life, she took the fruit and ate it. She had complete joy in God before that moment. She had everything, and she was deceived into thinking that there was one thing that she lacked, and she was made to believe that it didn't matter, and it mattered. It changed the course of the world. Now these people, our readers, are the opposite. They were living in the world and turned to God. And when John claims that these people know the Father and have overcome the evil one and are forgiven, can you hear the weight behind those words? It's as if he's saying, uh, do you remember how we used to be foolish, disobedient, deceived, living in hatred, idolatry, sexual immorality, keeping up with the lies and the lies that were told us and the lies that we said and wasting away our time in drunkenness and greed. But when the kindness and love of our Father appeared as Jesus, who lived and died for us, we came to know him and he saved us and he washed us and he justified us and he forgave us. And look how far we have come. Why would you consider going back? Do not. Go back to loving the world. Now, John has clearly said in chapter 1 that if we claim no sin, we deceive ourselves. That if we confess our sin, he will forgive us. And that is what sin must be in our lives. It's a temporary moment of failure, and our response is confession and repentance. That's completely different from a craving, a desire, a lusting, a longing for something that is forbidden. The fact that John is giving this clear warning to the people is evidence to us that the readers were being presented with the deception that they could return to this sinful lifestyle and still continue in their love for God. And John is saying, loving the Father has to bring true change, repentance, a complete transformation of the heart. A mere knowledge of Jesus or some small modification of your behavior is not acceptable. This lust and craving ties our hearts to the action. We cannot discount those actions that are in complete opposition to our love for God. Even just a bit of our heart believing that those things don't matter negates our love for God. Our joy cannot come from rebellion against God. And here's the kicker. Abiding with God depends on it. Eternal life depends on our love for God and our desire to spend eternity with him. Just in case the readers need another reason not to love, he says, the world is passing away. It is not prudent to exchange this perfect love for God that can continue for eternity with something that's going to be short-lived. All this pride and greed and self-centered living of the world is passing away. And those whose hearts are centered on that are passing away with it. Uh, there's a well-known quote by a missionary, Jim Elliott, from 1949 that says, He is no fool who will give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Do you see the contrast? The deceivers are saying, it doesn't matter how you live. And John says, oh, it matters. Do not love the world. 
And the deceivers are saying, you know, Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. And John says, oh, yes, he did. And because of his death and resurrection, you can choose to abide with God eternally. And the deceivers are creating tensions, and they're trying to pull people away. And John says, no, we live out our love for God by rejecting the lifestyle of the world and by loving one another and caring for the poor. So what do we have in common with the readers? In his classic book, Dietrich Bonhoeffer called this costly grace. He describes grace as costly because it's something that required Jesus to come and live and die for us. And then he contrasts that with cheap grace. Cheap grace is teaching people that you can obtain grace without ever discussing repentance and confession and discipline. So as we've talked about do not love the world, how are we doing? I believe that Christianity today has an image problem. The latest statistic I heard was 67% claim Christianity of Americans. 67% would say that they're Christians. 4% are living like Jesus. Four. And it begs the question, what is the cost of not discipling? wonder if we haven't asked that question yet. At the very least, our witness to the world is compromised right now. The Barna Group out of Minnesota did a large research study regarding this question. What is this change in the image of Christianity? And they do thousands, thousands of surveys. And they divided everyone into two groups. They said, okay, here, we're going to have these born-again Christians. And who can qualify for that group? Well, it needs to be somebody who's made a personal commitment to Jesus. And they have to state that that commitment is still important to them. And they need to believe that they are going to heaven at death because they have confessed sins and they have accepted Jesus as their savior. And anyone who says, yes, those things are true of me, will be in our group called Christians. And everybody else we're gonna put in this group and we're gonna call them outsiders. So we're gonna talk about the Christians and the outsiders for just a second. Unfortunately, what they found looking between 1996 and 2006 is that there was a drastic change in how Christians were viewed by the outsiders. In 1996, 85% of all of our outsiders had a favorable opinion towards Christianity's role in society. Did you grow up back then? I remember when Christianity was considered favorable. But a decade later, 38% claimed a bad impression of present day Christianity. The number of people walking around with a bad taste in their mouth towards Christians have almost tripled in 10 years. In fact, the top three words used now to describe Christians were anti-homosexual, judgmental, and hypocritical. How did we go from forgiven, know the Father, have overcome the evil one, to be known as anti-homosexual, judgmental, and hypocritical? That alone should make us ask. Well, how do we want Christians to be described? Jesus said in John 13 that all men would know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. Have you guys heard about those people who are going around in church parking lots and like peeking in to see what's going on in church buildings? Neither have I. That, that's not where they're looking to see if we're showing love, okay? As you drive down the road, and as you go to restaurants, and as you go to work, and as you go to school, and as you go to sporting events, as you go about your day, that's where the outsiders are seeing you. That's where they know, are you known for your love? It's easy to start listening to statistics and to make excuses or to dismiss numbers. But I wanna share with you some observations from the study that I think contributed to the shift in attitudes. The younger generations, age 16 to 29, 
when they were asked about key characteristics of Christianity, they said that they rarely see these things. They rarely see Christians who embody service, compassion, humility, forgiveness, patience, kindness, peace, joy, goodness, and love. 85% of them said, oh yeah, I know someone who's a faithful, committed Christian. But only 15% of those people said that they really could see a difference in their lifestyle because they were a Christian. Now Christians reported when they were told to prioritize, what's your top priority in being a Christian? And they reported number one, being good, doing the right thing and not sinning. That was above evangelism. That was above discipleship. And way down on the list were things like helping the poor, serving others, discipling children. More than four out of five Christians agree that Christian life is well described as trying hard to do what God commands. Ask, so they started asking Christians about their lifestyle. And this is a direct quote. In virtually every study representing thousands of interviews, born-again Christians fail to display attitudinal or behavioral evidence of a transformed life. When questioned regarding their activities in the past 30 days, there is no statistical difference when they're asked about whether they placed a bet or gambled, visited pornographic sites, stealing, consulting mediums and psychics, involved in physical fights or abuse, consuming enough alcohol to be considered legally drunk, using illegal drugs, lying, seeking revenge, or saying mean things behind another's back. And with further probing, the majority of Christians in their 20s and 30s said that all of these activities are morally acceptable. So let's ask the question again, how are we doing? If we are increasingly poor witnesses of a life and mind transformed by our faith, we cannot begin to shed this perception of hypocritical. We have a responsibility to our friends and neighbors to have a reasonable understanding of their perceptions. And I believe that it should at least warrant a self-evaluation. So I have some questions for you. Do you dress to draw attention or to be respectable for whatever the task is at hand? Do you eat to live or do you live to eat? Or the opposite, are you so concerned with your physique that eating has become difficult in your life? Do you think of sexuality as something good and sacred that God designed for a husband and wife? Or do you secretly like that it's interwoven into our culture's entertainment industry? Do you like that the current fashion trends are sexualizing women? Are you distraught at the way that our culture has destroyed sexuality? Do you use, utilize social media as a way to communicate and obtain information? Or do you spend a lot of time in mindless scrolling, allowing the advertisements and the false facades to just easily absorb into your mind, allowing this anti-God culture to influence all of your thoughts and opinions? Are you putting on a false facade for the social media world? There is significant evidence for how social media has contributed to anxiety and depression in our current society. Are you flippantly putting yourself at risk for that? The false facade that people present on Facebook may be intentional or not, but it shows us that this part of social media is in direct opposition to God's design for Christian community where we encourage and confess to each other. Do you marginalize certain types of people do you seek to give special attention to certain groups of people? Do you make judgments the way Jesus did? Are you loving your brothers and sisters? Would you change your job, your schedule, or activities in any way if Jesus was going to be physically present with you tomorrow? There may be activities that are, you know, permissible, you know, like a vacation once in a while. But are you filling all of your time with leisure and what you want to do and missing opportunities for service and evangelism? Are you purposeful and thoughtful about your entertainment, screens you look at, books you read, places you go? And what standards do you use to make that decision? 
Our culture makes the claim that when you age and mature, you're somehow equipped to watch and listen to greater amounts of violence, obscene behavior, nudity, and profanity. Do you allow culture to set those same standards for you? Do you look at and listen to things that are not okay to do and say? Do you laugh at what God hates? Are you getting your entertainment from things that Jesus died for? Our hearts must be postured toward love for God, and that love must motivate our actions and how we live on this earth. The surveys confirmed that a majority of Americans believe you can earn your way to heaven if you do enough good things. But when they were asked about their feelings about that, they chose guilt and obligation rather than joy and gratitude. And they walk around with this weight of not measuring up to God's standards. I want to ask you the same thing. Do you identify more with guilt and obligation or joy and gratitude to God? I believe this is the ultimate deception that has occurred in our generation. Our lives cannot be fueled by guilt and obligation. I guess I'll do what God wants me to. You can't live that way. Love for God doesn't look like that. The statistics show that it doesn't work. The people who are fueled by guilt and obligation are not living the way God called us to. And why would we live a life fueled by guilt and obligation to live an eternity with God? What is it about heaven that makes you want to spend an eternity with God? I'd like to suggest that those living a life fueled by guilt and obligation might be doing it for the pearly gates and the streets of gold. We cannot pretend to love God out of self-interest. A God who gave up everything to show love for us can't be loved that way. But those who love God in this current stage of life and allow that love to dictate their hearts and their actions and their thoughts, and they have postured their hearts to be servants of the kingdom, those are the people who will be overwhelmed and overjoyed, and they will have complete gratitude at the thought of living in eternity with God. Do you really love God? Do you desire to abide with him for eternity? Is that where your cravings lie? Those who are attempting to love God while loving the world have gone out from us. They may not even realize it, but they're creating hostility toward those who are forgiven, who know the Father, and who turn from evil by teaching that our lifestyles don't matter. But the outsiders have clearly seen this hypocrisy. There are likely people here who might say, yes, I am doing my best to live that way. I do love God. I am determined to obey his commands and love people the way he wants me to. And I do sin, but I confess, and I really believe that my heart is postured in deep love and respect for my God. And if you're one of those people, then I hope that you're going to consider how you can be like John. Are you actively teaching and warning and encouraging the younger generations to live this life well? How can you influence people around you? Take time to learn about the skepticism of the outsiders. How can you interact with those outside of Christ out of a greater love and understanding of them? Let's make it our goal to be effective agents of spiritual transformation in our own lives, as well as in the lives of other people. If the way Christians have been living and expressing themselves has led us to our current perception that's negative, then can't it be possible that our conversations and our lives can begin to change those negative perceptions as well? Receiving God's forgiveness and reflecting on this deep significance of what that changes for us demands transformation of our heart, complete abstinence from the things of the world. Our love for the Father and knowing that whoever does the will of God will abide forever should compel us. Do you believe that loving God matters? 
how we live our lives in this physical world matters. We can't live as part of a system that opposes God and simultaneously claim that we love God. Are you forgiven? Do you know the Father? Have you turned from evil? Do you love God and only God? Or are you deceived? Let's pray. Our good Father, we love you. I pray that you will help us to have a desire to be fully transformed. Father, that our joy and our gratitude to you will change our life. That we will leave these things that are only important here and that we will go on to serve you now and through eternity. We won't put that off. That we will recognize that that's the most important thing and it's valuable in our lives. Father, I pray that we will not discount the death of your son and the forgiveness that is offered through that, that out of love for you, that we will repent and confess and choose to live the way that you desire that we live. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name. I met Alicia a little over a year ago uh, at a ladies retreat um, and just something about her just from the offset got me just kind of perked my interest a little bit she seemed different than most of the people um, that I encounter and you all see what I mean now after that um, she I had talked to her about lectureships, and I don't even know how it came up, honestly. Um, and she expressed to me that she had felt like the Spirit was leading her to do something like this and had never got a, a chance, really. And so I said, I got one for you. And I'm so glad that I did. So we're so blessed to hear with us, Alicia, and I hope that you'll be back. Um, so can we give her a round of applause, please? Of course, the boys are probably still going, um, so we'll stay in here until they open the doors. So um, in the past, we've had to kind of be quiet as we end while they finish, but we don't. So feel free to talk amongst yourselves like we all women can do so well. Um, so let's do that now while we wait for the guys to get done, and then our next session will be at 11. Thank you.